technology is changing rapidly. This has created disruption to our economy as individuals, as a company and as a society. Our challenge is how do we master technology to our benefit yet at the same time help our workers to transit into the new economy. Minister, thanks for joining us. Now, businesses and jobs are rapidly transforming all around us. How will this affect our current jobs? There are two key changes. One, you can't just have one skill set for your entire life. And two, is that even if you are in a very distinct professional line, you cannot just depend on a very narrowly defined skill set. Maybe the best way to think of this is our smartphone. Chances are that every few weeks, if not days, somebody will upgrade the operating system and come up with new features for the smartphone. 20 years ago, a phone business was probably quite straightforward. It's about assembling a phone. Today, you not only assemble a much more complicated phone, you have to develop the software to constantly upgrade the phone and make it relevant because it's no longer just a phone. It's a computing device. And because the business is different, the kind of skill sets we need to produce and sell a phone has changed entirely. The world has changed. I think it's time for us to step up in terms of changing our mindset. Perhaps our people can take more pride in what we're doing. This disrupting world certainly provides great opportunities, far more than risks. Singaporeans with the right skill sets can do a lot more in the region and beyond. So take Ron's business, for example. He has been in the line for 30 years, but the products that his company produces keep changing, keep evolving. And he needs people who are very sensitive to the market needs to be able to innovate processes to develop new products that may not be even in the market now. And think about workers to be equipped with those skill sets to meet the new production needs. We must always bear in mind that in this new world of rapid change, there is no final end point. It is not about, I'm having some mismatch now and therefore I'm at a losing end. Actually, everybody is having mismatches. Every country is facing this challenge, whereby their workers, despite what they have learned in the schools and the vocational institutions, have to continue learning even as they come out to the job market. It's a race. Change is not easy for our businesses, not easy for our workers. But who can help their workers to be ready for tomorrow's job will win. And that is our challenge. So if we embrace the attitude, I think we'll be all right. I think Singaporeans, by and large, have the skill sets. But I still think that we need an uplift in the mindset. If I were to compare my Taiwanese staff versus Singapore staff, my Taiwanese staff are far more productive. But the pay is 40% of Singapore staff. If I were to also compare, say, China staff versus Singapore staff, Chinese staff are quite dynamic, quite competitive. They fight for everything that they want. And the pay is probably 30% of Singapore staff. Malaysia is probably half. Hong Kong, we are more or less on par. So, which means that we can gear up the mindset of our people so that with the skill set they have, they actually can uplift a lot more productivity. David, is this your experience as well? We are in the uh, store feature business. So, we help global retail brands roll out their global expansion. We have about 700 workers. 98% is outside Singapore. I agree with what Ron is saying about comparing the attitude and the competitiveness of the people. I realize that you know, the Chinese, they're very competitive. You give them a chance, they will learn. They will never like to waste the opportunity. This is something that I feel Singaporeans lack a little bit of that intuition. Listening to what Ron and David have said, there are a few points that will help us in this journey. We should see the world as our oyster. We are competing not amongst ourselves. We are competing with the rest of the world. We have to come together. We are not going to be able to compete with other people based on how low our salaries can go. We must compete on the quality of our ideas. 
it's never possible for Singapore in today's context to try to compete with some countries in terms of salaries. But we can compete in terms of the ideas that we have, the ability to learn, to innovate. There are other strengths that we have. For example, our brand of trust. People trust Singaporeans. People find that we are trustworthy, we are efficient. It is something valuable. We are a team player. We are also well exposed globally. Of course, that doesn't mean that people in other places are not trying to catch up. We have a head start. The question is, how do we make use of this head start to play on our strength? I think we can perhaps consider how do we instill that kind of hunger to learn and to be able to take failures as well. Exactly, which is how do we get the workers to understand that in order to adapt to the new economy, they need to have this adventurous spirit. How do we get them to understand there's an urgent need for them to do so? There's a paradox in this. We used to classify our workers as blue-collar workers and white-collar workers. Whenever we talk about upgrading, productivity improvements, we keep drumming into the so-called blue-collar workers, rank and power workers that you must upgrade, you must be more productive. Actually, from the labour movement, we have found that the rank and file workers, they are very conscious of the global competition. They know that if the company is not making money, the jobs will go somewhere else. They don't even need the foreigners to come into Singapore to compete with them. The companies might just move the operations elsewhere and produce at a place where the wages are lower, where people are more productive. There's a new group of people that we must convince to upgrade just as much. And these are so-called the white-collar workers. All workers need to be conscious that the competition is global. And that global competition requires us to be on our toes to make sure that we are constantly staying ahead of the market challenges. We compete not just by having a local mindset, a local skill set, but we compete by having a global mindset and global skill set. You have the latest smartphone. You use the latest apps. You do everything online. You update your phone to the latest OS. But is your skill set as updated as your phone? Minister Digital Innovation creates new opportunities but also causes job displacement. Mm. Nowadays, you even have news presenters who are robots, <laughs> right? So <laughs> somebody like me might lose my job to a robot. Uh -huh. What then? You are right, I fully agree. It displaces some jobs. It also creates new opportunities. So take the media industry. Recently, I visited a studio. They invited me for an interview. If you go to a typical studio for an interview, it means somebody like yourself, and a number of camera crewmen, sound technicians, and light technicians doing the interview. So when I visited this international news media outlet, the interviewer will talk to you from London. The sound crew and the lighting crew controlling all the equipment from somewhere else in the world. There was nobody around, just me sitting there, and everything was computerized. After the interview, the news clip was sent around the world to do the post-production and so forth. It's a round-the-world operation. Does this mean that then there's no more job for the interviewer, no more job for the sound technician, the light technician and so forth? No, it's just that they have now used the interviewer, the crew, much more efficiently because one set of people can do interviews around the world, around the clock. It has also created new opportunities because now you need new group of people with new skill sets to manage all these systems that are doing all the remote work. So it's not that there will be less jobs necessarily, it just means that there are new jobs that require new skills. Our challenge in this new environment is how can I help my workers to do all these new jobs? In new technology, you also need people to manage the technology behind the scene, manage the servers, manage the computer system. It's a very different kind of job. So our challenge is to help somebody who is perhaps displaced to go and have the new skills to manage those computer systems that controls all this equipment remotely. We need to change what we call train and place, meaning that I train first, then I go and look for a job. But when there are so many jobs available, so many options available, we need to move to place and train. If the Singaporean workers know what is the new job that he can get with the new skill sets, then being a very practical person, he will go after it. 
One of the things that the labour movement tries very hard to do is to inform our workers where are the new opportunities so that the workers can make an informed and considered decision to pursue the kind of training that will allow them to take up those new opportunities. In fact, the whole idea of job displacement because of technology is not new. The term technology unemployment was first coined in the early 1900s. It refers to jobs lost because of technology. A lot of research has been put into place that shows that, yes, jobs have been lost, but even more jobs have been created since then. The question would be, you know, what are the new jobs created? Where can people move to if the technology replaces your old functions? I can kind of think of two main categories. Jobs which require a lot of human interactions is something that your machines, your robots, still can't do as effectively. The other category would be jobs that require a lot of creativity. Yes, you can train the machines to do things faster, but you have to pre-program the end objective. Where are the new jobs of the future? It's high tech, high touch. Then the last one is high trust. Today, you can have a lot of internet platforms. A few big players will take most of the market because they have that brand of trust. You and me won't just go onto any website and buy things, mm. but we will go to the few trusted websites. Trusted, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's why I thought what has been shared is very true. It's the high tech, high, high touch, touch, and high trust. Actually, the high trust, I think we have quite a good head start. Generally, I think people do trust Singaporeans. I will agree with the Minister. Singapore as a brand has got very high trust. But here, I would like to play the contrarian because the government has done a good job, in my opinion. It's over-caring, <laughs> it's over-nurturing. <laughs> if we continue to be like that, are we making ourselves a nanny state? People are, in many ways, expecting and relying on the government rather than helping themselves. Same thing for our SMEs. I think that's a fundamental problem. I'm saying that we need to get them to help themselves. And that's always the dilemma between the government and the businesses. Policies that need to be tweaked and adjusted. They are not just about guarding against bad things from happening, but it's also about enabling good new innovations to help our businesses to grow. Not just in Singapore, but beyond. How do SMEs respond to these challenges? Our trade associations can help to bring the SMEs together and pull some of these resources. Now, it's easier said than done because many people will say, I, I don't want to share with you, you know, this is my proprietary <laughs> knowledge. But the question is that when we go overseas, how can we pool our resources to go as a team? How can we enhance this flow of good ideas from the research institutes to our own Singapore companies and allow them to work together and having a closer collaboration between the government research institutions, the universities, the polytechnics and so forth, working with the SMEs particularly we can help our SMEs to understand the markets beyond Singapore. It's not easy. I've spoken to many SMEs. i give an example of a particular company. They produce bread. It's easy to produce bread. But to sell bread in another country is very difficult because it's not just about understanding the taste, the needs of that market. We have to understand the whole regulatory environment before they can even sell a loaf of bread in that country. And to even have one loaf of bread so in that country, the regulatory process is so difficult for a small SME to overcome. The SME will just give up and say, OK, I, I, I will just sell in Singapore because at least I understand the standards required. I have to navigate all this bureaucratic environment elsewhere. But if I don't go into that bigger market, my market will forever be so small. It's not just about understanding the market, but also understanding the rules and regulations, the environment that our SME have to operate in. If we want to learn, then we must be prepared to venture to new markets. There's also something else that I think we can do together, which is that some of our bigger companies, they can play a role to help our smaller companies by bringing them along. In fact, sometimes we marvel at some of these Japanese and Korean companies because when they go, they go together as a team, as a pack. This is something that I think we can sometimes take a leaf from them. If you look at my business, if I fail to deliver on time, the damage is the opportunity cost. A deal renter can cost them dearly. We create a brand value of all our people, not just Singapore, but from Malaysia and China. If we constantly send them for training, we link them up with a culture, a culture that our company can only survive if we make a difference, embrace technology. We build a culture within our organization. 
We always say, do not use yesterday's skill for tomorrow's job. And then there's this mindset that people joke about. If I train my worker, what if he leaves me? He says, but if you don't train your worker, what if he stays with you? <laughs> then in your words, he's using yesterday's skills for tomorrow's jobs. So he says, which one is worse? The changing jobs landscape is leading to the creation of what we call a gig economy, where we use part-time or temporary workers. What does it mean for the workers? So there are both pros and cons in this new economy. On the plus side, it provides more flexibility for the new generation of workers. They might be quite adventurous, and that's where the gig economy comes in. It allows them to do different jobs using the same skill set for different employers. Then what are the potential downsides? It requires a lot of discipline on the freelancers to make sure that they take care of their long-term financial planning. Because a lot of these contracts are term contracts. They may or may not have CPF. They may or may not take care of your medical, your insurance and so forth. For example, let's say a freelance sports coach. Do you have medical insurance for yourself? Do you have workplace insurance? In a normal company, if you are injured, the company will take care of the medical fees and compensation and so forth. Are you aware of what are your legal rights? So like, for example, copywriters, photographers, musicians. What are your legal rights to the product and services that you offer? Some of these things require the individual to take on much more responsibilities in planning for their job. So it's not that the freelance economy is necessarily bad or good is that there are opportunities, but there are also risks. In closing, I'd like to hear from our panellists their experiences, your challenges, your success stories. Ron. In success, the function of three things, hunger, despair, or you have a desire. It's difficult to create hunger. It's also difficult to create despair, but it's not difficult to create desire. In my situation, I'm lucky to be born poor. It makes me hungry. So I started to work at nine years old. Half day in the school, half day on the street. In those days, a bowl of noodles is 20 cents. I went to the store and asked them, how much can I make? He said, between two o'clock to six o'clock, 50 cents. After I left army in 1979, I worked for some companies for three months as a salesperson. I started the business when I was 20. I hit my first crisis in 1985. 85 taught me two things. First, Singapore market is too small. Two, you must build a brand, a concept that you can scale. For example, when we bought Brookstone, GNC, Singapore franchise, Malaysia as well as Taiwan, the company was losing $12 million. But we turned it around. Today is very profitable, more than $20 million. In terms of Brookstone, I spent $100 million and I lost $100 million. But we are able, through that process, understand the financial world, how to do M&A, how to structure it. And I think today, we have more than redeemed ourselves. One has to take some calculated risk and be resolute going forward. It's a $100 million lesson, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I like to think about it, wait, like, because you have certain kind of like comfortable life, certain luxury, that's where you should strive even harder. Let's like, say, even if you fail, you know, there'll always be that net, but you don't take that for granted. In fact, you use that to strive harder. And a lot of people tell me, so, you know, now that you've built core levels, uh, now you're more well-known, not just in Singapore, but globally. We're the second fastest growing finance app in the US, and we are not even from the US. In fact, in the top 10 table, we are the only one that's non-US. Someone from Silicon Valley actually contacted us and nominated us to be featured. So core levels is not my first startup. It's actually a second startup. The first startup, I guess, failed spectacularly. So I think we need to instill in our young ones to break free from that whole social stigma associated with failure. And even if you fail, there's already value in it. When I joined Futuristic, 18 years old, I can't speak a word of English. I learned on the job. I had a very strong resilience to learn. Along the journey, there are many failures. It's tough. I didn't do well. In 05, we transformed our business from an interior contracting business to a global store feature specialist. That's where I see the world as my oyster. 
along the way, there are many hurdles. And that's only a process of getting there. I was not in business. <laughs> okay. I can only share with you some snippets of my experiences in my growing up years. I went to Indonesia and I had to work there for two years. I didn't know the language. I didn't understand much of the culture. I didn't know the system. And the lesson was that even at the age of 30 years old, I can and I must learn a new skill, a new language, a new understanding. And if I'm prepared to do that, even if the success was not in the immediate short term, many people will feel that it's very challenging to leave Singapore and work overseas. I left to work in Jakarta one month after my daughter was born, my first daughter. And at that point in time, every other day, there would be some trouble in Indonesia because it was the post suharto era. People thought that it was very dangerous, that you should not go there and leave your family behind. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, there were many adjustments that required to be made. You come out stronger. You come out understanding things a bit better, being a bit more realistic. Each and every one of us must do our part to keep learning, keep asking ourselves, where are those new opportunities? It will do us good. And if we can do that collectively, I see no reason why we cannot transcend our geographical limitations, our resource limitations. If we seize the opportunities that the new technologies bring, there'll be many more opportunities for Singaporeans and the next generation of Singaporeans. Their future might be even brighter than our future and our forefathers' future. You know, end of the day, success is a function of two things. What you believe and what you do. And to be successful, one needs to be met. Mindset, attitude and drive. And to be a successful leader, you need to be a mad cow. Cow meaning courage, openness, and willingness. I always think being a mad cow is important. <laughs> Incidentally, in the labor movement, we also have a mad cow acronym. I think it was left to us by Im Sui Se. He says, make a difference, change our world. <laughs> Which is what we challenge each and every of our staff. Try to make a difference to the life of the workers whom we touch and try to leave behind a less imperfect world for someone else. Mm -hmm. So, lesson learned, <laughs> everyone should be a mad cow. Yeah. <laughs> mad cow. <laughs> well, the future of our job market is changing. It's understandable for there to be anxiety over what this means for current jobs. Companies have to step up efforts to innovate and find new ways to create value and stay competitive. For us all, it means learning new skills, gaining industry-ready experiences and having a positive mindset about embracing new ways of doing things. Thank you for joining us. We will be back with another episode on the future economy. Join us then. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.